Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining Mark and I as we continue on through First Kings. A little bit of battles going on today. A little bit of war. Yeah. First Kings chapter 20. And uh, this is going to be a conflict between the king of Syria, Ben-Hadad, and the king of Israel, the northern kingdom, Ahab, who's a very evil king. Yes. You remember from the last chapter that uh, uh, Ahab's wife Jezebel was, had vowed to kill Elijah, and Elijah had to flee. Um, and now he's going to be called to uh, anoint some other kings in Syria, another king in Israel, and a, a mentor, uh, Elisha, who's going to take over in prophecy. But now there's kind of this inter interlude here where the time of war. So let's take a look. First Kings chapter 20. Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his army together. Thirty-two kings were with him in horses and chariots. And he went up and closed in on Samaria and fought against it. And he sent messengers into the city to Ahab, king of Israel, and said to him, Thus says Ben-Hadad, your silver and your gold are mine. Your best wives and children are also mine. And the king of Israel answered, As you say, my lord, O king, I am yours and all that I have. The messengers came again and said, Thus says Ben-Hadad, I sent to you saying, Deliver to me your silver and your gold, your wives and your children. Nevertheless, I will send my servants to you tomorrow about this time, and they shall search your house and the houses of your servants and lay hands on whatever pleases you and take it away. The king, the king of Israel called all the elders of the land and said, Mark now and see how this man is seeking trouble. For he sent to me for my wives and my children and for my silver and my gold, and I did not refuse him. And all the elders and all the people said to him, Do not listen or consent. So he said to the messengers of Ben-Hadad, Tell my lord the king, all that you first demanded of your servant I will do, but this thing I cannot do. And the messengers departed and brought him word again. Ben-Hadad sent to him and said, The gods do so, so to me and more also if the dust of Samaria shall suffice for handfuls <laughs> for all the people who follow me. And the king of Israel answered him, Tell him, let not him who straps on his armor boast himself as he who takes it off. <laughs> when Ben-Hadad heard this message, he was drinking with the kings in the booths and said to his men, Take your positions. And they took their positions against the city. And behold, a prophet came near to Ahab, king of Israel, and said, Thus says the Lord, Have you seen all this great multitude? Behold, I will give it into your hand this day, and you shall know that I am the Lord. And Ahab said, By whom? He said, Thus says the Lord, By my servants, the, the governors of the districts. Then he said, Who shall begin the battle? He answered, You. Then he mustered the servants of the governors of the districts, and they are 232. And after them he mustered all the people of Israel, 7,000. And they went out at noon, while Ben-Hadad was drinking himself drunk in the booths, he and 32 kings who helped him. The servants of the governors of the districts went out first, and Ben-Hadad sent out scouts, and they reported to him, Men are coming out of Samaria. He said, If they have come for peace, take them alive, or if they have come out for war, take them alive. So these went out of the city, and the servants of the governors of the districts and the army that followed them, and each struck down his man. The Syrians fled, and Israel pursued them. But Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, escaped on a horse with horsemen. And the king of Israel went out and struck the horses and the chariots and struck the Syrians with a great blow. Then the prophet came near to the king of Israel and said to him, Come, strengthen yourself and consider well what you have to do. For in the spring the king of Syria will come up against you. And the servants of the king of Syria said to him, Their gods are gods of the hills, and so they are stronger than we. But let us fight against them on the plain. Surely we shall be stronger than they. And do this, remove the kings, each from his post, and put commanders in their places, and muster an army like that army you have lost, horse for horse and chariot for chariot. Then we will fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And they listened to their voice and did so. In the spring, Ben-Hadad mustered the Syrians and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. And the people of Israel were mustered and were provisioned and went against them. The people of Israel encamped before them like two little flocks of goats, 
but the Syrians filled the country. And the man of God came near and said to the king of Israel, Thus says the Lord, Because the Syrians have said the Lord is a God of the hills, but he is not a God of the valleys, therefore I will give all this great multitude into your hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. And they encamped opposite one another for seven days. Then on the seventh day the battle was joined, and the people of Israel struck down the Syrians, a hundred thousand foot soldiers in one day. And the rest fled into the city of Aphek, and the wall fell upon 20,000 men, 27,000 men who were left. And then continuing on, Ben-Hadad also fled and entered an inner chamber in the city. And his servants said to him, Behold, now we have heard that the kings of the house of Israel are merciful kings. Let us put sackcloth around our waists and ropes on our heads and go out to the kings of Israel, to the king of Israel. Perhaps he will spare your life. So they tied sackcloth around their waist and put ropes on their heads and went to the king of Israel and said, Your servant Ben-Hadad says, Please let me live. And he said, Does he still live? He is my brother. Now the men were watching for a sign, and they quickly took it from him and said, Yes, your brother Ben-Hadad. Then he said, Go and bring him. Then Ben-Hadad came to him, and he caused him to come up into the chariot. And Ben-Hadad said to him, the cities that my father took from your father, I will restore. And you may establish uh, bazaars for yourself in Damascus, as my father did in Samaria. And Ahab said, I will let you go on these terms. So he made a covenant with him and let him go. And a certain man, continuing in verse 35, and a certain man of the sons of the prophets said to his fellow, to his fellow at the command of the Lord, strike me, please. But the man refused to strike him. And he said to him, because you have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, behold, as soon as you have gone from me, a lion will strike you down. And as soon as he departed from him, a lion met him and struck him down. Then he found another man and said, strike me, please. And the man struck him, struck him and wounded him. So the prophet departed and waited for the king by the way, disguising himself with a bandage over his eyes. And as the king passed, he cried to the king and said, Your servant went out into the midst of the battle, and behold, a soldier turned and brought a man to me and said, Guard this man. If by any means he is missing, your life shall be for his life, or else you shall pay a talent of silver. And as your servant was busy here and there, he was gone. The king of Israel said to him, So shall your judgment be. You yourself have decided it. Then he hurried to take the bandage away from his eyes, and the king recognized him as one of the prophets. And he said to him, Thus says the Lord, because you have let go out of your hand the man whom I devoted to destruction, therefore your life shall be for his life, and your people for his people. And the king of Israel went to his house, vexed and sullen, and came to Samaria. <laughs> wow. All right, yeah. let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, the truth of your word. We pray, Lord God, you would be with us now and teach us from your words how to apply it to our lives here and now today and what we can discern from this interaction and the history of what had gone on in between Israel and Syria. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. So we could start higher at the, the beginning. I, I think you see right off the bat how evil Ahab is because Ben-Hadad comes to him and says your silver and gold are mine your wives and children are mine yep and the king's like sure yeah no no problem but then Ben-Hadad comes back again and he says not only are we taking your silver and gold and your wives and your children but we're going to take whatever from your household that pleases our eyes we're just going to just we're, take it all we're just going to take it all and uh, then he's like well that's too much yeah. <laughs> right. So, so you can have uh, you can have my wife and children, but no, not my things, not my stuff. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's it's sort of I don't know. It was more. I think that Ben Haddad was more trying to humiliate at that point because yeah. you know, back in history, you go to war and you take tribute back. So you know, it's like okay, you go and you conquer the neighboring country and you bring back the gold. And then 20 years later, they conquer you and they take the gold. And so, you know, this was this was the type of thing that was done. It's like, okay, 
I promise I won't invade you if you give me money. Yeah. And so that was a typical thing. But this was Ben-Hadad saying, I am going to go into your house, and I am going to go into your servants' houses, and I am just going to take and take and take, and you're going to like it, mm -hmm. and you're going to thank me for it. Yeah. And so it's one thing, you know, it's one thing to give it voluntarily. It's something else to have it taken. But this is a case where it's not just taking from Ahab. It is taking from anybody. Right. And so here you have people who Ahab was sworn to protect because, you know, he is their king. Yeah. And so, you know, it's the whole transactional, I am your king, you follow me, and I protect you from everyone else. And so here you have Ahab having all of this power taken from him. It's like, no, I can't let you just go and make me look bad in front of all of my people. <laughs> so, you know, it's finally enough. It's like, no, we're going to fight. And so here you have this massive Syrian army. Whether it was 150,000 people or whatever the numbers work out to be, whether it was actually 150,000 or not, it's not like Ahab was pulling together a huge army at this point. He had 232 people from the governor's and seven, servants. Th seven thousand. And then 7,000 just people in the city. Yeah. And so this is a much smaller army. Yeah. And so it's here like you 20, have, 20 times the, the size. 20 times the size. Yeah. And yeah. so you have the Syrian army and they're camped and they're drinking and they're partying. Mm -hmm. And ben -Hadad is like, yeah, you know, if they're coming for peace, take them prisoner if they're coming for war take them prisoner anyway. so there there's there's an arrogance there there is a complete and utter arrogance yeah, because there. he's like we have so many we are so superior to you even if you come out to fight it's easy for us to just kind of take yeah. you prisoner we'll take you alive we'll take you alive and i mean look at the terms he was offering it's like i'm just going to take everything i want <laughs> and maybe left you with a handful of dirt <laughs> yeah. and so you know these were the terms he was offering. He was expecting to get it. Oh, yeah. And then Ahab stormed out of the city, and it's every man killed his man. So, you know, here you have the army of the Israelites, the army of the northern human, sweeping out of Samaria. And this is almost like you would see in the movies. It's like this swarm of locusts cutting their way and they're through. Just striking yeah. down. Striking. Just striking down left, right, and center. And so the Syrians run, and then a wall falls on them. Which is just... <laughs> so the, the Lord finished. Yeah, they, re, they retreat to Aphek, but that didn't help. No. That, that, that came. So the Lord, obviously, you know, without even saying it, the Lord's hand's in the battle. Oh, yeah. Obviously, he's giving them the victory because there's, from a human perspective, zero chance. No. They have no chance. But well, the Lord is with them. And then they surmise the, the – because – they're polytheists. They're polytheists. They're yeah. like, well, the God of the Israel is the God of the hills. So let's devise plan number two, which is we're going to fight them on the plain where we have the maneuverability of our chariots. They don't have chariots. We have better war equipment and we can maneuver on the plain. It's like, you know, where do you have a tank battle? Yeah. Not in the mountains on the plain is where you have a tank battle. So they're the, the tank of that day was the chariot. The tank of that day was the chariot. <laughs> and, and so they, they're like, yep, we can whoop them for sure on the plane. And of course, this is challenging God himself now because it's not that Ahab is a good king. He's, a, he's an evil king. No. He's a is. bad king. Uh, but God, they're like, God's like, you know what? First of all, he says to Ahab the first time, I'm going to give them into your hands uh, and that you may know that I'm the Lord. Yes. And now the second time, it's like, well, a couple of people are going to know you're my, You're going to know I'm the Lord. I'm going to give them in your hands again. But they're going to know I'm the Lord because they thought that they're going to fight on the plane and that's going to give them success. So so really, it is God who is doing this, the whole, the whole thing. Uh, and so their God, verse 23, their God are gods of the hills, and so they're stronger than we, but let us fight against them on the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. <laughs> and yep. so, 
So they're challenging basically God himself. The, and, but God himself is the true God, not this fake God that they have. Yep. And often in the Old Testament, and it becomes progressively less so. Uh, I mean, you saw this all of the time with Joshua and some of the time with David, where there were people who, when they were beaten, they were just beaten to the ground. They were just totally eliminated. And here you have Ahab giving mercy to Ben-Hadad. And Ben-Hadad comes out in the sackcloth with the rope around his head. So, I mean, you could just imagine how pathetic he looks, you know, yeah. dressed up as, you know, like a grocery bag. And so here you have this, he's humbling himself. He's like, oh, have yeah. mercy on me. And Ahab's like, I'll have mercy on you. But that, ben, wasn't, that wasn't the Lord's will. That wasn't the Lord's will. You know, the Lord's will is like, look, they defied me. <laughs> they said I have no power. Yeah. These must, they're being eliminated. Devoted to destruction. Yeah. And yeah. And so Ahab was like. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting. It's like uh, verse Ben-Hadad said to him. He's like, this is uh, his appeal and his offer. Verse 34. Uh, the cities that my father took from your father, I will restore. And you may establish bazaars for yourself in Damascus as my father did in Samaria. In other words, we, you, you have uh, favored trade status yep. <laughs> in, in Damascus, right in the city of Damascus. And they have like, yep, sounds like good to me. All right, we're good to go. Uh, and then it's kind of this bizarre thing where the prophet says to somebody, strike me. Yeah. And uh, you're supposed to injure him. And the guy's like, no, I'm not going to do that. Well, because you divide the word of the Lord, a lion's going <laughs> to yeah. kill you. <laughs> so, that's, that's a little bit, you know, odd. Yeah. And, and, I'm not sure what I would do if a friend came up to me and said, hit me. Yeah, it's strike like, me. I, I, but this is from the Lord. Follow the command of the Lord. So strike. And then the second person does strike him. And then the prophet kind of bandages himself up. Yeah. Right? And, and uh tells of this uh, this story to the king um, and then he's, he's like the king's like well you were supposed to guard the guy yeah and you let him go now your life for his life you're in big trouble and then he takes off his, the bandages it's like this is what you were supposed to do and you let the guy go yep <laughs> and so you did not follow through with what the Lord had called you to and it says I think in verse 43, and the king of Israel went to his house, vexed and sullen, and came to Samaria. And so God had given them great victories, but in the end, it really made no difference in the king's life, the king of Israel's life. Yeah. He um, didn't follow through and follow the Lord. He didn't repent. He didn't turn to God. He never changed his ways. Uh, he continued to be swayed by his evil wife, Jezebel. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, he just goes from bad to worse, no matter what the Lord has, has shown. And so, you know, I've met some people in life not, like, doing the same things that Ahab did, uh, but have had great miraculous things, things done in their life, and they continue to refuse to follow God. They <clears throat> just put it off to happenstance, or you can always write it off yeah. somehow. You're just like, well, yeah, you know, it was it was it was a great thing, but I was just lucky <laughs> in there. Yeah, I believe in coincidences. I don't trust them. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's there's so many times, so many people, when greeted with a miracle, refuse to accept it, refuse to continue on with it. Yeah. I mean. If Ahab continued on saying, okay, the Lord handed me Syria or handed me the king of Syria, I'm going to take all of Syria or I am going to, you know, if he had decided to move on, would things have gone better for him? Well, I mean, there was always, never, there's never. always hope, right? Uh, it, no matter how much evil he'd done with the prophets of Baal and all that kind of stuff yep. that was going on, um, 
I am sure if he would have humbled himself and repented and turned to the Lord that, uh, that it would have been different. You know, God is merciful. Oh, yeah. God is merciful. And he would have, he would have changed the direction of his life. So uh, there's hope. There's always, and there's hope for all of us uh, as we oh, yes. stand in rebellion against God sometimes that God is merciful. Uh, he's faithful. His love is everlasting. If we but repent and turn to him, uh, he stands ready to forgive. And that's that's a great thing. That's that great. is a wonderful thing. Yeah. So let's go before the Lord in, in prayer. Father, we come into your presence giving you thanks this day for your word, the truth of your word, uh, how you are the, the God above all gods. All the other gods are fake gods, uh, false gods. Uh, there's many times that in our own life that we look to false gods, um, trust in other things but you, but help us to learn from this, to trust in you always, that you are the God of creation, you're the God of redemption, and you alone is salvation found. So we're thankful, Lord God, for your amazing grace and forgiveness. You, And as we're just uh, a few days, not even a week out from Easter, we remember that you conquered sin, death, and the devil for us. So we praise you and thank you for the life you've given to us in and through Christ. We praise in his name. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful weekend.